Today on my channel, Planner Friends, we are going to do a flip through of my faith, second faith planner, which is a prayerful planner for the month of January. So stay tuned. Hello, Planner Friends. Welcome to my channel. I'm One Crafty Dolo, and I'm so happy you're here today with me. Thank you for taking the time and spending it here. Uh, today, I'm just going to do a flip through of my prayerful planner for the month of January and to show you what I've been studying and how I decorated it and so forth. Um, this was a kind of an impulse purchase. Um, I purchased it for September. It's undated. It's huge. It's heavy. And I do love it. It's a daily planner. Um, I don't use it for planning whatsoever. This is more of my Bible journaling and Bible study space. And what I've been using in this planner is this study from the Daily Grace Co. Um, this is the Sermon on the Mount, which is actually my absolute favorite biblical passage. And I'm not quite done. <laughs> uh, where am I? I know it's in here. I put a little marker in here for me. Huh. Uh, before that, I just started Matthew 7. Well, it's in here somewhere. I think I got through 1 through 6. Yeah. And I believe... Yeah. I'm in here somewhere. Well, anyway, I'm on Matthew, um, the Sermon on the Mount, on chapter 7. So I'm almost done with this, which is kind of exciting. But I've really done a deep dive this year so let's go through this for january and i can share it with you if you're new you're welcome to subscribe and tap the notification bell so you're notified when my videos upload so i've just decorated this whole thing and i've been using it very um every day i may not do every single day what i may do is do a day or two in advance do a day or two catch up but I've been pretty steadfast in, in keeping up with this. Um, what I did is I um, adhered the monthly plan to that. So uh, the other thing in this month, I made a mistake. I had skipped these two pages. So this is nine and 10. So we're going to come back to it. So where are we? We are uh, part of the reason this month I really just did a deep five dive into Matthew 6 was a lot of it has to do with anxiety. And I ended up developing some anxiety about 10 years ago and it's come and it's gone. Um, sometimes it was really bad and it was tough because I really took too much on and sometimes it's been okay and I've been okay, not good. But that doesn't mean I don't have a bad night or a bad day or a bad moment. And I think we all do. And certainly, if, as I said to a friend of mine, if you didn't have anxiety before the pandemic, you likely do now, unfortunately. That was really debilitating and is debilitating for many people still. So let's go into this because if you have anxiety issues or you know someone, this is a good place to start, to be honest with you. So, yeah, and what I'm doing in here, incidentally, I'm quoting a lot from the study or I'm quoting from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And I, if I don't write the verse down, then I'm quoting from the study. And normally I would take notes on something, but I thought the way it's written in the study was really helpful, which is why I'm quoting it. And again, if you are dealing with anxiety or you know someone who is and they're Christian, point them this way, okay? Because this makes a difference. So, what do you treasure? What are your greatest ambitions? Who is your master? The focus of the sermon is shifting away from hypocrisy to anxiety. And even though I've read it and read it and read it previously, I think that was a good, It, in many ways, the Sermon on the Mount is pivoting. You think about, you know, blessing the multitudes and the Beatitudes, and then he gets in, Jesus gets into the hypocrisy of the way people act versus their faith and what's really guiding them, right? Oh, I hear dogs outside. I don't know whose dogs they were anyway. And yet, with both of these things, the problem can be boiled down to an excessive focus on self. 
So keep your focus on God and selflessness. And remember, in, I had just done a um, deep dive into two chapters of Luke for Advent. And I wanted to remind myself here of how selfless Mary was in accepting uh, what the angel was telling her and God's will. So the hypocrite is concerned about his reputation and what other people think of him or her. The anxious person is concerned about everything. I think that just sums it up, doesn't it? And so the anxious person, they're not hypocrites. They're just concerned about everything, right? And anxiety, it says, is a burden we are not meant to carry. And I really, really like this. The anxious person thinks that everything depends on them and they are crushed under the weight of this burden that was never meant for them to bear. So whether you have anxiety about uh, finances, a relationship, a work situation, how much, what I'm reading here is it's saying how much is it because you're carrying it by yourself and the burdens of the world pile on you. That was certainly my case. Um, This is about a heart issue. It is a question of where our affection is found. Until we focus on the things of, will we focus on the things of self in this world or will we shift our gaze heavenward and focus on the things of eternal value? And I really like this analysis and I love that particular line, gaze heavenward. Um, I like the wording really, you know, um, we don't need positive thinking. We need theological thinking. We don't need inspirational words. We need God's word. And I think this is an interesting point because uh, I have a little bit of a beef with a lot of um, self-help gurus and influencers using the rabbit ears there because I think they make money by telling you you are a problem or you have a problem and somehow they're selling you books and courses and all kinds of things telling you you need to be fixed maybe you don't need to be fixed let's try that on maybe you're spectacular just as you were made and the the idea that they're going to help you there's one particular um I'm not going to mention by name I I jokingly refer to her book about, you know, brush your girl, brush your teeth. That's how I say it. That's not the title. But here's an example of what I mean is they, she and her husband built this empire. Okay, good for them. And then they held all these marriage retreats and they're charging people an arm and a leg. And, oh, we're going to inspire you to the best relationship. Oops, they got divorced. And then she turned that into another book and another shtick. And I just was like, ugh. It just, yuck. So, inspirational words from friends, sure, inspirational words from family, but when somebody makes it their business, yuck, don't like it. And I don't mean to be critical on other people, but that just gives me the creeps, to be honest with you. Okay, back to the deep dive. Sorry, I digress. It's just those self-help people are like almost cult-like, and it's creepy. Like, you need to start, and you need to do, ugh, I'm good. I may need help with my mindset sometimes or other things, but you're good, okay? And if you're not, there are ways to remedy that. All right, I'm sorry. Let's get back here. (laughs) Jesus points us to the truth that upside down priorities cause anxiety. He urges us to put our hope in the things that last. And I think the upside down priority loop, as I kind of said, I like this verse a lot and about what it means for my mindset and your mindset, perhaps when Jesus speaks of not laying up your, not laying up your treasures on earth he is not merely speaking of money. It's about where our priorities are. The world versus God. And then we have to go back to, uh, like I said, I skipped these two. And here I'm actually quoting the gospel of Matthew. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and when left, where, where thieves, sometimes I have trouble reading my own language, thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasures are, 
where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think that's a really good verse. Um, <laughs> it's reminding us where to focus and place value, right? And that this world is temporarily, when he talks about rust and decay, this world is a temporary state, even though we're slogging through here and we sometimes lose sight of that. Okay, so we get into this whole thing about the money. Jesus is focusing us on the things that pull for our time and attention and affections. The problem is not having money or things, but being consumed by them. And that is true. Whether you have wealth or don't, don't let its pursuit have a hold on you. And I think this is an interesting, in terms of anxiety and this tying in of, you know, pursuing Focusing on the earth, focusing on other priorities, focusing, I would add, on this kind of self-help mentality and not, and turning away from God, shall we say. So this part here is important for me, and I'm going to explain why. The eye is a lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. That's Matthew 6.22. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So this comes up later on um, in January. This idea of the eye, not only as a vehicle of sight, but a vehicle inward. And I think that the metaphor there, the way he's playing with it. Now, I had, um, everybody talks about their one word for the year, and I couldn't think of one word. So I came up with this phrase, and that was before I did this study. And this study just made it more, I don't know, more real to me, if you will. And so I designed these cards to put in these little, you know, um, pockets here. And that's my phrase for the year, is be the light. So when I read this, I couldn't help but think of how, you know, focusing we see on the outside. But what about seeing on the inside? And I think that's actually really powerful to think about that, how he constructs this verse, what he's saying, what, what it means, right? And he says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And that's Matthew six twenty four, right? And this is a reminder how Jesus shone God's light back into the world, right? He wasn't he's our savior. He wasn't this, just the prophet. He wasn't just the son of God, but he's a, holding up a mirror to people. So we talk about the sermon and we don't, we talk about the hypocrites. We talk about valuing money, but much of this, this <laughs> section is talking about looking inward, looking at yourself and saying, Hmm, things that make you go, Hmm, right. What am I doing and how am I doing it? And then we go back to anxiety because he ties the anxiety into looking outward versus looking inward versus looking upward. And I think I really loved this, this month. I did. I really loved it. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. That's Matthew 6, 25. Look at the birds of the air, he continues. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet, and yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? And I think this is really important because it ties everything together in that we're, we're looking around us and saying, gosh, we're looking um, inward or at others instead of really looking inward. And then we develop all this anxiety. This was a really... I wish I'd read it again in this way. I don't know that the study was available 10 years ago, but I think then the past 10 years would have been a bit different in terms of my anxiety levels. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. So work, walk forward and trust in love and in faith. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. And I, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Right? We all, you've heard that, I'm sure, many times. And I thought, oh, boy, these are good. This is really, 
Jesus tells us that our natural and human inclination is to serve, seek after, quote, all the things we seek after, all those things that cause us to worry then. So it's a, a feedback loop. How's that, right? You you worry, but you're worrying because you're looking out at things and you're worried about how am I going to do this? And you're taking all these burdens on. You don't look up and then you get back to the start of anxiety, which just then worsens. We seek after food and clothing. We seek after control and prestige. We seek to do it ourselves. Now, I don't know where you are in those, but I'm that one. We seek to do it ourselves. And Jesus is telling us here that our natural inclination is wrong. We are wrong. Surprise. Our natural inclinations are misplaced. Worry is a lack of trust. My son and I dug into this last night because I was going back through this in preparation for this video. And I was reading this with my son. And it was a really, I don't know, it was a really great moment between us because he's like, yeah, hey, worry is a lack of trust. When we worry, we're choosing not to trust God is in control. If we could see and know who God is, we would not worry about a single thing. Okay, now... I think the study might be overstating it. You're going to worry to some degree, but where does it tip from natural worry? Like I'm worried about my son on a maternal level, but not obsessive. But then when does, you know, worry become anxiety, right? Our view of God will impact whether or not our hearts are filled with worry. And the best way to ensure we have a proper view of God is to immerse ourselves in scripture. So as I said, my son, I had him, he and I were going through this last night and that was a really good moment for us. So let me share that with you. If you're dealing with it or someone in, close to you is dealing with this anxiety, worry is a lack of trust. When we worry, we are, not, we are choosing not to trust God is in control. Kind of remind yourself of that one. And then this turns, pivots into the judgment, which is Matthew 7. And people talk, uh, throw this verse around all the time. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And why are you, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye? We come back to the eyes, okay? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. So in other words, you've done far more than that person. And then you point. I think one of the key virtues that this whole sermon from beginning to end comes up with again and again is humility. And I think in general, humility is the underrated virtue. Uh, and I think it's kind of being hammered home here a bit in a, in a good way. Don't get me wrong, right? Jesus is telling us that in light of all that we have been forgiven, when we were worthy of judgment, we should be gracious and merciful for others. So Jesus is saying to us, not so fast, buster. <laughs> Here's a paraphrase for you, right? Not so fast, buster. What have you done? What are you doing? How are you doing things? Before you look at somebody else's scans, look, turn your eye inward. We come back to the eyes, right? So often we tend to deal harshly with the sin of others and mercifully with our own sins. And so it's about deflecting and not accepting that humility. And here I come up with diligence and grace. We should be diligent to rid our personal life of sin and we should be gracious with those around us. Right? The word hypocrite is not foreign in to the sermon, he's telling us over and over the focus is inward holiness. So that brought that back around. And this I thought was so good, I added it down here. Jesus doesn't just want us to change what we do. He wants us to change who we are, meaning our natural inclination is to worry about things we shouldn't worry about. Our natural inclination is to judge others harsher than ourselves. And woo, right? It's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, so Jesus is calling us to lay down our critical and harsh spirits. He is asking us to view people the way he views people. And I, I didn't plan it this way. I, I follow the study where it takes me. But that's really kind of the mic drop moment, right? Look at others the way you are look, being looked at. I want to do a quick thing here on the decorations in here. 
What I committed to do this year is to try to go through my craft supplies without buying too many more. As you can see, I have a punch, um, a heart punch. I picked it up a while ago from Recollections and I decided to use some of the paper collections I wasn't using. I also used bits and bobs from Echo Parks, Faith Forward um, collection, and there's another one, Faith something, that I'd picked up a Tuesday morning. So I used some card, you know, card stock here, all of it, right? Colored card stock. I used these card stock washi. This is actually, this is from an old Felicity Jane kit that I just repurchased ironically. What I do incidentally with this is I save where I cut them out and then I use those also as decorations. And I really like doing that. I think that's a cool way to do it. You can see here, are more of the hearts, more of these, some of the older washi I've got laying around. Because if you don't use your washi tape up, you lose it. So I used washi, I used all these different cards in here. I did a very different, I did some inking as you can see. I found some decorative brads. I thought these were really cool. Um, again, I used the hearts, and then what I did here, is it this? No, hold on. Then I did this one more simple. So these hearts are here. These are the, the backside to the green is this blue. So then I just flipped them around and played with them in here and used more of these in here. It was really fun. I gotta be honest with you, it was really fun. These are just random shapes I had, and I was like, well, let me put them in. Why not? And again, more of the hearts, and you can see here, I use these. So that's it. That is my faith planner, my, well, one of my faith planners. I have two. This is my prayerful planner and the, the January flip through. So thank you for taking the time. And I hope that if possible, I may have given you some ways to cope with your own anxiety or somebody around you. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed week. Thank you so much for taking the time and spending it with me. Bye, planner friends.